It's wonderful to see all of you here today on this gorgeous spring day. And thanks to those who have tuned in on Zoom. I'm Carrie Toronto Brayman, director of the UB Gender Institute. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land upon which the University of Buffalo operates, which is the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nation Confederacy. Today, this region is still the home to the Haudenosaunee people, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory. Today's panel, Social Reproduction in the Majority World, is the final event of our year-long series on social reproduction. And all the talks in the series have been recorded and posted on our YouTube channel, and we'll put a link to that channel in the chat box for those on Zoom. We began this series in September with Sylvia Federici, whose 1975 manifesto wages against housework challenged the way that housework was traditionally understood as a natural attribute of women's physique and personality, and that's Sylvia's words, rather than as a form of unpaid labor that was imposed on women. She spoke on the origins of social reproduction and how it has evolved. Next in the series was Pramila Addison, who visited us from Barnard and talked about how capitalism created the care economy and how the demand for care has been placed on women and mainly poor women of color. Why is it that care work has become synonymous with women's work, she asked, as an extension of women's unpaid domestic labor in the home? She said plumbers and landscapers also care for the home, and they are not considered care workers. Last month, we brought social reproduction closer to our home in a panel about housing justice in Buffalo which currently has one of the highest eviction rates in New York State. The panel featured India Walton, Rava Gramazian, and Kianga Gamata-Taylor, and we, dis we discussed how the right to affordable and safe housing is interconnected with reproductive justice, um, affordable education, and uh, Kianga invited us to think about what radical public housing in the U.S. would look like, because we have this kind of narrow, and so did India, about a narrow notion of public housing is either high rise or low rise, besieged by poor conditions and filled with people who are living in abject poverty. That was key on them. Today, the series moves beyond the US and European countries to focus on the global South. But as my colleague, Marion Werner taught me last year, it's more apt to say majority world because rather than the global South, since this is, these are the conditions of the majority of people on the planet. In fact, in the international spirit of this panel, the majority of our panelists have flown in from great distances, <laughs> namely London and Beirut. And I'm delighted to welcome Professor Alessandra Mazadri and welcome back Gabriella Nasi, who could join us today. And before I turn it over to Mary to introduce the panel, I just want to say three more things. First, there will be a reception right after the panel, and I hope you can stay a bit longer and chat afterwards. And tomorrow, there's going to be a lecture by Professor Mazzavi at 315 in 170 Academic Center in Ellicott. And it's titled The Afterlife of Industrial Work. And if you don't know how to get there, um, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but Sarabi does. <laughs> if you need it, the Gender Institute, at 2.30, it's going to be nice weather tomorrow. You can all venture with your compass and map and find it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mary, I know that's your home base, but it could be on another planet. <laughs> and for those people who don't know where the, where the gender is, the gender is <laughs> shame on you. That's right near Starbucks. All right, there's uh, on the second floor. Don't don't check. You're right near the Marine Recruitment Center. So don't go through the wrong door. Don't <laughs> and finally, this I'm getting a little bit close. I want to thank the members of our organizing committee for the last time as we finish up two or three years of this collaboration. Katya Prosnik, Marian Werner, Yige Dong, and Jim Holston as well as the graduate students Sarami Pont, Gabriella Nasi, and Joey Seacrest for a year-long collaboration that resulted in a Baldi Center grant. And we're grateful to the Baldi Center, of course, as well as to our co-sponsors, the Departments of English, History, Philosophy, and Arts Management, 
And finally, I'm grateful to Megan Vaughn and Sadabi Pant at the EB Gender Institute for all of their work behind the scenes to make this event and every event possible. <laughs> Okay, welcome. I'm going to be very brief. I'm Marion Werner, Department of Geography over there. <laughs> complex. It's not too hard to get there. You can grab that bus that goes in front of Starbucks and it takes you to the Elkhart Complex. Get off and ask. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a pleasure and honor to introduce our panelists today. I want to just say something super brief about the motivation for the panel. So the genesis of the panel came from conversations amongst the organizers of this um, year-long event on the significance of the standpoint for our, for our thinking about social reproduction. Much of the contemporary de debate takes the experience of the Global North as its point of departure. To put it simply, the debate presumes a fraught post-World War II transition from Fordist industrialization to neoliberalism and the rollback of social guarantees that resulted. But this trajectory is, in fact, a specific experience and viewpoint, particular to the overdeveloped world an experience made possible through its relations of subordination of internal peripheries and colonial and new colonial territories. Our panelists today work to center social reproduction in our understandings of society and global capitalism in contexts that are rarely foregrounded in these debates. And yet it is these majority world contexts that are probably most suited to ground our understanding of social reproduction's modal condition in late capitalism on a warming planet. So without more of ado, um, I want to start by introducing Alessandra Masadri, uh, who is a reader in the Department of Development Studies at SOAS in London, and a leading scholar on social reproduction and the author of The Sweatshop Regime, Laboring Bodies, Exploitation and Garments, made in India uh, with uh, Cambridge Press 2017. And uh, Dr. Masadri will speak for about half an hour, and then we'll turn to Gabriela Nassif, doctoral candidate uh, in Global Gender and Sexuality Studies, who will speak for about 20 minutes. Gabriela will defend her dissertation on migrant domestic workers in Lebanon tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> the dissertation argues that the extreme precarity of migrant domestic workers cannot be addressed without attention to the broader care crisis in post-colonial states like Lebanon, where the promises of welfare and social security that were to accompany self-determination never materialized. She'll start her position as a senior research associate in the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University in DC shortly. Finally, we'll be offered just uh, 10 minutes of commentary from Dr. Ida Dong, assistant professor in sociology and global gender and sexuality studies. Um, and Dr. Dong will offer um, insights based on her work on the century long transformation of women's paid and unpaid labor in China through the country's transition from a communist revolutionary state to a capitalist authoritarian one. So without further ado, we'll turn our attention now to Dr. Masadri. Thank you for the very generous uh, introduction and for this uh, fantastic um, invitation to speak in this uh, uh, series. So I'll start with the, I'm happy to be here and uh, how difficult it is to step into sort of the shoes of people that came before me. The fact that the series started with the uh, in seminar by Sylvia uh, in particular really humbles me to be here today. Um, it's great because uh, uh, a lot of the scholars that uh, featured in the series actually have guided my work in different ways. And in fact, I'll just uh, perhaps also explain a little bit of how I just uh, uh, um, so this, uh, um, I thought of this uh, intervention as also in connection with some of the issues that they uh, raised. So hopefully we can make some connections there. So I was particularly asked um, uh, to speak of uh, social reproduction as practice uh, in the context of uh, this seminar and uh, uh, as a method of inquiry. And this is an issue that is particularly dear to me, and it will allow me uh, to um, sort of say something about the connections between theory, method, and politics, which uh, too often do not necessarily appear as uh, uh, we write to analyze uh, 
uh, the uh, material world, but instead it, sh it what should always guide us. In fact, once lately, I found myself to talk and write about social reproduction as a theory, or better, reclaiming it as a subject or object of many theories, from uh, early social reproduction analysis uh, uh, to social reproduction theory, indeed, or more recently, what I define as race uh, uh, social reproduction approaches uh, in connection with the work of, for instance, Dardi Bhattacharya, my engagement uh, with social reproduction uh, has started off indeed as a practice uh, and stemming particularly from my field work on informal labor relations, uh, characterizing what I'm not seeing as defined global supply chain capitalism. So how I define myself as a feminist political economy of work and I fo focus on uh, informal economy globally. I started off from Italy, a country that has the highest incidence of informal labor in Western Europe. And then I moved to study India, which is the country that has the highest incidence of informal labor in the world, with an astounding 93% as we speak. So this interest in informal economic relations has led me to specialize in what I would by now call sweatshop economics. So much of my research work has focused on analyzing the workings of textile and garment global factories and their specific labor processes uh, and it's uh, um, all the, the relations that are needed to form uh, a commodity in our case, in my case, our clothes. So I focus on the Indian subcontinent mostly, although I've done a little bit of work uh, elsewhere uh, in uh, collaboration and uh, this work has involved different passages. First, it has involved the identification of the different places and spaces composing the global factory in India, which is a, an extremely complex entity. And that's to give you some sense. With this map. Secondly, has involved documenting working conditions in each of the chambers of the global factory where labor processes vary tremendously and they entail combination of factory and non-factory labor in particular and a different uh, approach, sorry, a different relation to gender, ethnicity and mobility uh, 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 especially. Now, what this uh, uh, mapping really uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, suggested uh, very strongly is that exploitative relations vary uh, uh, considerably across the, the, the subcontinent and suggest how global capitalism works through uh, what the Indian Marxist historian Jaris Banerjee has called uh, a multiplicity of forms of exploitation. So exploitation is not something that appears only in a unique form that generally as assumed being epitomized by wage labor, but indeed it manifests in many different ways. Now, one could say that to an extent, all this theoretical and political analysis of mine has started with an obsession of uh, trying to explain the mechanisms of exploitation in different contexts and what to do about them. So it's in the context of this obsession uh, that I discovered social reproduction, so that I actually started studying first the Indian political economists to then go back eventually to uh, feminist, uh, um, Italian feminist autonomous, despite being an, an Italian myself who was left many, many years ago. So when I say discovered social reproduction, I have to say that it literally, I feel sometimes in my recall that I stumbled over it as I was uh, basically researching something else. Um, or what I thought was something else. So how did this happen? So I spent around two years in India uh, for the mapping of what I would later call the sweatshop regime and uh, uh, started off from urban, mostly export oriented areas, which you see in the uh, map uh, behind me. Uh, and then uh, instead, uh, eventually moving to very urban and uh, rural India. So for this work, I interviewed a bunch of people, starting with exporters, subcontractors, labor contractors, intermediaries, and what you have it. And then of course, the workers in factories, as well as the workshops and homes. 
our clothes are really sensuous, uh, complex uh, uh, commodities, and they require uh, many tasks. So they require entering and exiting a multiplicity of spaces and realms uh, uh, of work and life. I spent another year, in fact, working on uh, in Barilmi, in Uttar Pradesh, which is the state uh, right of Delhi. Uh, so somewhere here, I guess, right? Um, and uh, um, to capture the relations between labor contractors uh, and uh, um, home-based workers. And this is what the relations uh, will look like instead once you move towards the lower ranks of the, um, of the commodity chains. These are possibly the most marginal workers of all, and certainly those who get the lowest salaries, face discontinuous employment, and are exposed to cheating and wage theft and by contractors on a daily basis, and who are the, uh, um, in a sense, uh, workers that often are not even uh, uh, recognized as workers. Mm -hmm. So they're invisibilized generally under the umbrella term self-employment, uh, uh, which uh, has been misguidedly reproduced and regenerated uh, through the work of international financial organizations through the years. Uh, the World Bank most famously adopting what we call the legalist approach to informality has regenerated this uh, misguided conception that uh, the wageless, uh, if it appears in uh, sort of forms of economic activities of this type, might be a form of micro entrepreneur. Now, these are also the workers that taught me more about exploitation and how it unfolds in practice uh, in, in this relation with gender, ethnicity, and race, well, in this, in this case, of course, in India caste, and more broadly, life. And even though uh, studies of labor in uh, global supply chains uh, focus primarily on factory work, it's actually here at the bottom of the supply chain that the confrontation between capital and labor, and so exploitation appears in its rawest form. It's a struggle over time, over appropriating literally all the time available to workers and to colonize their whole life and life spaces. Concretely for home workers, the distinction between work and life is blurred and they work whilst engaging in life-making activities, especially women, uh, engage in embroidery work as they cook, tend to children, elderly, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So, it is by watching them in the everyday that one really makes sense of Cindy Katz's rather famous definition by now of social reproduction as the quote, fleshy, messy, and indeterminate stuff of the everyday that is entangled with work as a key capitalist relation. It is the observation of the dominance of contractors, uh, employers in this setting, over the lives of home based workers, and especially women. That led me to grasp the relations between production and social reproduction in shaping work and livelihoods. It's here at the bottom of the supply chain of the global factory it, that these appear as the social factory, which is what first Mario Tronti theorized in the 70s and Silvia Federici feminized in her work subsequently. And Silvia uh, rightly noted. Uh, 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 how the social factory perimeters need to be drawn starting not from the space of work, uh, but from the kitchens and the bedroom. So in a similar way, in a sense, uh, I could understand in the sweatshop regime, uh, starting from the alleys of the uh, peri-urban uh, uh, sort of uh, chambers uh, of uh, the district of Barili and uh, around, uh, from the village, here, contractors dominate life by being at once employers, your bank of last resort, uh, the local patrons, those that will uh, come for the religious uh, ceremonies that concern you or your children. Um, and so they act as effectively what the development economist Barbara Ellis White has called uh, 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 masters of the countryside. And markets, credit, labor, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, are interlocked, an expression used by the wonderful uh, woman economist, uh, 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 Krishna Bharadwaj, um, that really sort of did a fantastic work on forced commerce in the subcontinent uh, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. So one uh, could say that contractors uh, dominate life and then the economic relations, they make it 
uh, uh, possible. So exploitation, in short, is first a reproductive before being a productive experience. Now, this realization for me changed really everything. And it could have not happened, it could only have happened at the bottom of the stretch of regime or the global factory of studying, because from the bottom, one can look up and see the old beast. And I think it's a tremendous vantage point to understand socioeconomic phenomena. And this was in fact put quite neatly by Gianga Yamata Taylor in relation to COVID quite recently, when in 2020, um, they writing on COVID, they highlighted how it worked as a magnifying glass exposing uh, all the inequality shaping contemporary capitalism. COVID literally offended life and quote, when things are turned upside down, the bottom is brought to the surface and exposed to the light. Indeed, from Barili, I could observe the stretch of upside down and its working, uh, uh, its complex working could not be more clearly revealed. <laughs> so from the vantage point, social reproduction was not the realm to investigate that impacted by work relation, but rather it was the broader canvas uh, on which everything took place in the way it did. So exploitation did not impact on social reproduction or life, but rather it co constituted the very mechanisms that I was interested in exploring. Now, this realization was so powerful that it, re it required a re-engagement with all fields or questions that since that started off in a more kind of classic uh, global labor study uh, uh, fashion. And also it led me to revisit fieldwork uh, sort of uh, uh, approaches and strategies, even in uh, uh, the factory segment of uh, the sweatshop regime. So the study of the factory itself uh, uh, had to start from the home, exactly as Federici put it and Maya Nies already theorized it uh, in her work on housewifeization. Well, she did work in Narsapur after all, one of my dreams is actually mapping the, what happened from Narsapur to Barilla in the last 50 years. Um, and so the study of the global supply chain in a similar way had to start from the village because the home and the village ultimately are those that produce the most precious commodity of all. That is the, all the labors that are needed to sustain global capitalism. So the labors of social reproduction are the building pillars for all labor to be understood and studied. At this point, I returned to Delhi and eventually to other industrial areas and reoriented my whole fieldwork in factories and urban areas, centering the analysis of social reproduction in the work I was doing. Also to study the way in which it could constitute the industrial rhythms, temporalities and trajectories of industrial production. So starting from social reproduction foregrounds different questions for field research and particularly allows you to center dynamic uh, interplays between work and life, and instead stop studying this phenomena as if they were compartmentalized uh, separate universes. And uh, um, uh, so I wasn't studying anymore just the assembly line and its organizational social layout, but also in relation to how it connected with how workers lived uh, their daily lives in industrial areas. So I moved the analysis to dormitories, uh, industrial hamlets and colonies and slums uh, in order to study interconnections between the two. So we were starting meeting factory workers, not only around the space of work, but also uh, more importantly, where they live daily. Uh, the Marxist sociologist of China, Pung Nai, noted how industrial dormitories must be, must be understood as key parts of the labor regimes in fact. Uh, they often uh, run. Uh, they are often run either by employers, that the same people that run the factories, uh, which of course establish the dorm as a sort of stretched uh, um, uh, spatial dispositive that connects directly to production, um, or um, by the state, which enables capitalist accumulation through uh, also through the management of the open system, which, like a tap, regulates uh, migration flows in the area as described by um, many uh, uh, scholars of China, Anita Chan, Xin Kuan Li, Kuna yourself, and, and Jenny Chan, and of course, uh, uh, Yves Dong, uh, whose work I, uh, I admire and, and learned a lot from recently in relation to how this uh, sort of intersection of life and work can impact uh, on different communities very differently. 
she's done a fantastic work on the Foxconn uh, mouse. Mm -hmm. um, so um, adopting uh, social reproduction as a lens, as a practice to guide our fieldwork and as a method, not just the theory, right? Allows us to bring work back to where it belongs that is part of an outcome of a broader relations shaping and enabling uh, the inequalities that sustain the capitalist system. Quite crucially, using rep social reproduction as methods also help us translate fieldwork uh, into writing in ways that stress these dynamisms that I was trying to communicate uh, 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 as I was speaking. So the dynamic linkages that exist between different spheres of social life. And uh, we are able to write about our experiences uh, of fieldwork uh, in ways that uh, amplify work as part of life and life uh, uh, as connected uh, uh, to uh, work. So we are able, in a sense, to let social categories uh, come to life, right? And uh, you should never, we should, should really be the difference between uh, merely theoretical research and instead empirical informed research, opening yourself uh, to the contamination that, you know, the concrete actually brings uh, uh, about. In fact, in, in my last book, Marx in the Field, which is about, uh, we hope, to come out in paperback this summer, it came out very unfortunately in the middle of the pandemic. Um, we, uh, together with the dream team actually, of an extraordinary group of, of friends and comrades, we discussed how you can deploy Marxian categories, uh, first in connections with different uh, 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 radical traditions, ranging from feminist to post-colonial theory, um, and uh, critical um, realist uh, uh, analysis, um, and also how the process of fieldwork itself, uh, what the process of fieldwork itself reveals about those categories, methods, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, you can guess that my chapter there is called Marx in the Sweatshop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, well, they actually started off as, as a chapter and then it just uh, spiraled out of control. <laughs> now, by centering social reproduction and study of exploitation, we effectively combine political economy and feminist insight with extraordinary outcomes. As we expand the social perimeters of the social factory, we also expand the remit of the category labor to, increase, to include all those activities which are so clearly central to the process of value generation. In premise, all those that generate and make the workers of today and tomorrow namely the caring, the cooking, the grooming, the nurturing, the loving, that is uh, all the stuff uh, that kicked off the debate in early social reproduction analysis in the first place uh, through the uh, interventions by Maria Rosa Dalla Costa, Thelma James, Silvia Federici, uh, Leopoldina Fortunati, and so on. Moreover, however, we also able to appreciate how not only reproductive labor, but social reproduction as a realm, as the space of life making, as uh, uh, Titi Bhattacharya put it in uh, her SRT volume, sustain and subsidize this production. It allows us to explain how the village supports the global supply chain and how the dormitory supports and regenerates the factory. The unveiling of the dynamic relations and co-constitutions of production and social reproduction moves us away from representation, um, from um, representations. Uh, ha, I got lost. Of value and value extractions, uh, as value is not a thing but a social process uh, that takes place across many sites that stretch from the form to the skills of work. And they, production and reproduction are inextricably related when it comes to value generation and labor surplus extraction, an issue that I obsess about and I dedicated a fair amount of time um, uh, to. So in the enclaves and villages uh, of Barili, this issue appeared obvious because that is uh, the escalation of the conflict between capital and labor is just really all encompassing, but it's really literally uh, everywhere. It doesn't just characterize the life of home-based workers. Well, there is where it appears uh, um, in all its tremendous, well, I would say violence, right? In terms of the extent in which it can colonize life. 
And the extent to which one cannot distinguish between life and work is uh, also uh, sort of given by the impossibility of uh, creating labor market surveys that uh, might distinguish and separate between what is uh, a credit, sorry, what is uh, a productive and consumption cost, <clears throat> what is credit and how it changes from advances. You are unable to apply simply any of the classic uh, uh, sort of uh, categorization that you would use, that I would use uh, on labor survey in general. Yet also in industrial areas where work and life can be mapped against different temporality and spaces, uh, one located in the factory, the other in the dorm or the enclave, value can only be understood as made and extracted based on their type of penetration with the assembly line effectively beginning on the bunk beds or the dorm or the tiny room shared by eight uh, in industrial colonies, because of course uh, in a uh, 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 great part of South Asia, this is how the dormitory labor regime look like, very different from the type of uh, dispositives that you find uh, um, elsewhere. This is because it is the location of the workers on those bunk beds or those rooms that increases <laughs> the constant availability to the assembly line and expand their day endlessly and then mold them into compliant laboring subject. I think if the employers was also the one that was your landlord, right? Uh, they could recall you over and over again to work whenever they wanted. And the uh, making of a compliant subject is something stressed so well by the feminist geographer Hannah Schling. So centering social reproduction as method allows you not only to see value making in all its complexities, but also the structuring of this process in motion as it happens concretely. Most of all, deploying social reproduction as method enable us to multiply the subjects of labor and exploitation of our story of global capitalism. It's not just the wage labor, but it's uh, all this uh, multiplicity of forms of exploitation of workers, people exploited in different ways that finally uh, uh, are de-invisibilized in this story. Um, their labor and exploitation can be identified based on the contribution to value generation, which is not only based uh, on uh, the wage, and in fact, as stressed by Silvia Felici once again, the wage is patriarchal and is also quite racist. So it is always excluded and still excludes uh, uh, men. It does not reflect the value of labor. It reflects, uh, as put by Antonella Picchio, its price or one of the forms that its pricing has uh, uh, entailed. Now, this is a particularly relevant point to discuss in a seminar series aimed at exploring social reproduction from a majority world uh, perspective, that is today's uh, objective. So in trying to convince you of the power of social reproduction as methods and all the concrete examples uh, that I discussed uh, uh, in this talk uh, from the world of precarious, informal, informalized work, uh, uh, the message for me is that this is the majority word. When I initially used the expression in my work, uh, I actually focused more on this so-called uh, uh, global south as also a sort of an, an alternative uh, um, sort of name for it, which I think is very much needed. I would agree with, with Marion. But actually, I think we can scale up this even more. Uh, the last ILO estimates uh, set uh, um, the uh, percentage of informal employment uh, in the so-called global south at 69.6% of total labor, right? 70%. And this can be broken down in different regions, 85.8% in Africa, 71.4% in Asia and the Pacific, 68.6% uh, in the Arab state, 53% and more in the Americas and so on. Yeah, I think uh, reflecting on uh, uh, these estimates, we can go further and understand the majority world as representing the whole world of work, or the massive majority of it. So given the weight of labor from this region, in fact, but also through the uh, multiplication of uh, forms of gig work and platform, the rise of platform capitalism, they increasingly represent also uh, uh, working uh, poverty, 
uh, uh, in uh, uh, this neck of the woods. So much so that the overall estimate uh, for is the 61.2%, which really we should reflect on. 61.2% of the entire planet labors informally. And we can only understand this work based on the interconnection that exists between production and social reproduction, being social reproduction a key way in which valorization and extraction take place. So basically it's a lens that is the key to understand how we survive under capitalism, period. Now, when I started this talk, I stressed the, uh, how the discussion of social reproduction as practice enable us to reflect on the links between theory, method, and politics. And the process of the invisibilization of the labor of millions, women, and wageless workers that a social reproduction lens uh, focus on the majority world allows uh, has massive theoretical, methodological, but also political implications. So zooming into the politics as I conclude, uh, uh, I think uh, hopefully will just uh, be a good place also uh, to sort of uh, see uh, uh, where this discussion can lead us. Um, in my view, the purpose of theory and methods must always be political. And this is not always necessarily the case uh, in uh, labor studies, although it should. Otherwise, we might fall into the trap of what I would call as working poverty voyeurism, which I think uh, some modern slavery analysis actually fall into. Let's see if we can use satellite technology to see what's the likelihood to find a modern slavery spot that look very nice in pictures without have pictures in the garden. Now, <laughs> concretely, stressing the centrality of social reproduction for labor and exploitation means reorienting um, the political and policy work towards this realm. Premila Nadesen, who also hosted here in this seminar, rightly writes how capitalism invented the care economy, uh, has a wageless realm for appropriation and exclusion. It definitely has. However, these spaces can be reappropriated for action and it's happening as we speak. Mm -hmm. So it can become a very fruitful terrain for struggle and for organizing. And to conclude with a couple of examples from the areas where I, I do my field work, uh, unions are finally reorienting their political work and organizing work in many parts of India on the community, exactly mm -hmm. trying to harness what Maria Rosa and Selma call the subversive power of the community. And there's a very sort of uh, prolific literature here in the state on black feminists that have just raised this issue lastly with reference to COVID Nina Banks. So the organizing that you do starting from the uh, reproductive spaces uh, also uh, sort of uh, overcomes uh, the fact that precarious labor space of work will change continuously. And there are also instances now where you do start seeing uh, uh, organizing work done in uh, uh, villages uh, uh, where the migrants uh, come from. Uh, second, I think not only reproductive spaces, uh, as already argued by Funa and others, uh, uh, have to be seen as potential new problems of resistances, but also an attention to the productive and the reproductive combines uh, also offers us the possibility to overcome distinctions between what are labor struggles and reproductive struggles. So we tend to sort of uh, compartmentalize these two as distinct. And I think a lot of uh, connections there are uh, sort of uh, posed in the uh, radical politics of housing, for instance. Uh, and, and that is all great news because these are all effectively working class struggles. Um, I think all these debates uh, are just playing out in the level at the level of policy as well, and uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the context of, for instance, debate in or against uh, for or against uh, basic income. That is actually an issue that has been discussed by feminist scholars for a very long time. You can actually see wages for housework as a sort of uh, proto part of uh, the basic income campaign from a more sort of a subversive point of view. And then again, I think the direction of travel is not to be stuck in this separation between what is a wage support demand and what is an income support demand, especially because ultimately for the wageless, an income demand is the demand for a wage. So I just stop here. Thank you.
Thank you so much. We'll turn it over now to Gabrielle. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm sorry. So can everybody hear me? Because I, I think I'm going to stay muted. Um, so just before I get started, I just wanted to say again, reiterate my thanks to everybody on the panel. Um, I've used all of their work in my dissertation and in this presentation. So if there's a little repetition, let me fly. Um, and thank you to the organizers and to everybody who put this together. Um, it's really great to be back and it's super great to be, to come back at this moment after how many years of working on my dissertation, which has looked at social reproduction and to kind of see it in this moment of, re, of resurgence. Um, so. In the interest of keeping this a bit on the shorter side so we can have more of a discussion, I just want to kind of raise some points about the research I do in Lebanon, um, how I use social reproduction, um, because it's very close to uh, what Dr. Zavadi was saying. I also really like to emphasize it as method, not just as a theoretical framework. Um, and, you know, how I find it to be so useful and generative in the context of a country like Lebanon. Um, which is post-colonial, which has been, you know, called a fragile state, which has been called a collapsed state, which has been called, um, you know, a state that's been taken um, under siege, taken hostage by uh, different groups, like including uh, organizations like Hezbollah. Um, so I find this much more generative in thinking about um, the way the state is, is, is kind of organized, among other things. So, um, as I mentioned, I'm in my work, I look at migrant domestic workers um, in Lebanon, and these are primarily non-Arab workers. Um, this is part of a longer history that began with Arab workers um, functioning as domestics, and then in the 70s and 80s, you know, in part related to the civil war that occurred in Lebanon, these eventually transitioned into becoming primarily non-Arab workers that come from all essentially all over the place, um, parts of Asia, parts of East Africa, now parts of West Africa. Um, the numbers, of course, vary, and I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in is thinking about social reproduction in relation to the kind of care work that goes on in the social reproduction landscape that evolves in places like Lebanon, uh, where migrant domestic workers are a key buttress to ensuring that people kind of receive the care that they need in their daily lives. Um, and here I'm drawing from a post-colonial scholar who, um, told her, her last name is Kuntri Kuntz, who writes that um, in these parts of the world, there is what's called a challenge to the reprivatization of social reproduction thesis. Um, so in her words, that is a universal understanding of social reproduction that really emphasizes the shifts between the public and the private sphere um, and the retreat of the state from social provisioning. So as Marian mentioned in her opening remarks, this is really the history of kind of social reproduction care work that we are familiar with and that we're taught, but it's very much so not a universal, um, not universally applicable and is really grounded in the West and is really grounded in the minority world or the, or the global North. Um, so instead, uh, so it reflects the Western bias, and it equally ignores the dynamics of context-specific forms of social reproduction that take place across the majority world. Um, so building from Kuhn's, I also draw on other Q theorists, including the speakers on this panel, um, and in particular, um, scholars who work on indigenous forms of, um, or that work on indigenous, indigenous types of production and reproduction and social reproductive labor. Um, to emphasize social reproduction as a set of processes and relationships between these different types of labor and how categories, um, example, uh, such as reproductive and productive labor are historically contingent and develop over time. So to clarify then the emphasis here and in my own work is not really to engage in arguments uh, about whether or not social reproduction might be considered what Susan Ferguson calls capitalistically productive um, or productive in the normative Marxian, Marxian sense of productive labor. Rather, I start from the premise, uh, of course, that social reproduction, especially in a country like Lebanon, where my research takes place, is not only productive. In fact, I argue over and over again uh, that without the labor of migrant domestic workers, um, in particular, and historically racialized and gendered uh, communities of laborers in Lebanon, um, social reproduction would not be, could not be done in Lebanon. Um, but beyond that, I use social reproduction really to examine the shifts and movements within what scholars call this like, broader social reproduction landscape um, to look at the ideological and material organization of it and how this has changed over time. Um, so 
As a brief introduction to my work, my research begins with the lived realities of migrant domestic workers in Lebanon. Um, so according to the most recent statistics from the Ministry of Labor, um, which are from 2019, there are 250 formally registered migrant domestic workers in Lebanon. This is, of course, highly inaccurate, um, not only because so many workers are what many people would call illegal, but I prefer not to use that term. They are just not registered with the Ministry of Labor, either because they've escaped from an employer, uh, they've run away, or their papers have lapsed. Um, so we generally tend to assume that the number is much, much higher. 250,000. Yes, yeah, sorry, 250,000. We actually assume that number is, is much closer to 500,000, but of course this has changed and it's that's what I will talk about in a minute here um, in, in the aftermath of the multiple crises that have hit Lebanon since 2019. So generally uh, non-Arab women migrants come to Lebanon as domestic workers and they enter under what's known as the kafala system. So in Arabic, that just means sponsorship system. Um, this is a highly exploitative system as, as anybody who's kind of worked uh, in the Arab Gulf or the, the Arab states region knows because what it does is it ties migrant domestic workers' residency permits and their work permits, they must have both, it ties them to their employer. So effectively, this is what one legal researcher um, calls the transfer of power from the state into the hands of the employer. So the employer functions as the state. There is quite literally no room for movement between the employer and, and the employee. And this is, of course, exploited it for many, many different reasons, uh, all of which I'm happy to discuss in more detail uh, later on. Um, so among the problems is that workers cannot leave or seek employment without the, like, they can't seek other work without the approval of their current employer. They are in, excluded from the labor laws. They have minimum legal protections. Um, the latest iteration, for example, of the standard unified contract, which was put forward in 2009, it's not even implemented. Of course, as feminist scholars have long talked about, it's very hard for the state to penetrate the private sphere and the household, and that's done on purpose. That's in order to kind of allow and perpetuate these highly exploitative um, practices, you know, allows them to continue. And even worse, as of 2022, um, it's come to light that a new standard unified contract has been put into practice. And I put that in quotes because it was passed without representation from any of the workers that's supposed to represent or any of the civil society organizations that have been mobilizing for a new contract and instead was passed with the uh, blessing of the syndicate of recruitment agencies um, and the Ministry of Labor. As So as I'm sure you already know, that indicates that this is of course in favor of the employers and in favor of these recruitment agencies who make so much money on bringing in workers uh, to work in Lebanon. Um, so migrant domestic workers are uh, without a question, are without a question, uh, highly exploited, underpaid, poorly treated in Lebanon. Um, so rightfully, this exploitation has been studied primarily through the employer worker dynamic. Um, this is particularly the case in the way that the discourse surrounding migrant domestic workers and their labor contributions is framed in Lebanon, both by their advocates, so that means organizations that support domestic workers, but also by um, those who would be happy to see the system continue as it, as it exists today, meaning um, government representatives, especially from the Ministry of Labor, and of course, members of the Syndicate of Recruitment Agencies. Um, for example, we can frequently see a critique of employers' treatment of workers coupled with this logic that goes something like this. So because workers are providing such important work, because they're doing this care work, they deserve to be treated better. And it's because of this relationship to the work that they're performing, that's why they deserve rights. Um, this is, of course, extremely problematic, and I'm following Kim and Madison's critique of this um, dynamic. Uh, because it, it reasserts and it reproduces their subjectivities as workers first. Um, and what that does, of course, is to situate migrant domestic workers' claims to rights as dependent on their productivity as workers. Um, what social reproduction really offers in this instance is to actually, ironically, as much as it looks at labor and work, it offers us an opportunity to challenge the um, identification of migrant domestic workers as workers and to challenge the fact that advocates are arguing for their rights based on the work that they're doing, which I, of course, argue completely overlooks their, their subjectivity as racialized and gendered often very poor workers without legal standing in Lebanon, right? So it completely overlooks that and argues that if workers actually get access to 
um, the legal system as protected workers, that they will somehow be able to sort of overcome all these other, other difficulties, if that makes sense, right? So we're really thinking about um, how this is very problematic and how becoming a worker, for example, in better standing, or as Dr. Mazadri mentioned, perhaps moving from informal work to formal work is somehow the fastest way to give workers a more dignified uh, existence um, in Lebanon, which is, which is not the case. Um, and importantly, following the onset of COVID-19, um, where we see global feminist discourse surrounding care work and the inequality and vulnerability of care workers really start to kind of take a global position. We really start to see it, yeah. We really start to see it come up. Sorry, I have two more points. Oh, good, good. Um, thanks. Uh, we, so we see this resurgence of, of care work and we see what emerges as this notion of essential workers. And I really take seriously in my work this critique that comes from Estelle Perenias and Rachel Silvey that says, ironically, of course, this is just another way of kind of reframing that earlier problematic that I mentioned, which is that workers deserve, care workers deserve rights because they are doing care work, because care work is so important, without necessarily attending to all of the other problems um, that come with being uh, you know, a migrant domestic worker in this case. Um, so with that in mind, I'm trying to use social reproduction to actually reframe migrant domestic workers, not just as social reproduction providers or, or care workers, if you like, but to actually think about them in relation to their status as race and gendered um, people, race and gendered migrants in Lebanon, who also must secure um, the resources, um, both materially and ideologically, to meet their own social reproduction needs. Um, and that's become especially important because as Dr. Mazadri noted, when you start from the bottom and look up, it provides a much clearer image of what is actually occurring and what is helping to sort of perpetuate this kind of environment of exploitation that domestic workers are facing. So making that small shift away from the worker and the work status of migrant domestic workers to actually positioning them in relation to social reproduction does several things or helps us accomplish several things in them. Um, so the first is that right now in light of all the crises that are going on. Thinking about workers as also people that need to secure their own social reproduction needs helps us to move away from this very humanitarian discourse that's also come up post COVID-19, which has said that workers are doing this very brave um, kind of struggle. They're resisting against exploitation by taking care of each other, by forming community networks to feed each other, um, you know, making sure that other women get registered and get their COVID-19 vaccines. Um, a lot of this discourse came up and it was it was great for the attention it brought to the issue, but again, simultaneously quickly overlooked the fact that this is part of the larger struggle that helps to perpetuate their positionality as racialized and gendered workers, if that makes sense. So their inability to consistently access social reproduction in a way um, that meets all of their needs is part and parcel of why they are continuously exploited and remain this highly classed, um, you know, highly racialized, highly gendered workforce in Lebanon. Um, so I want to just, oh, and the, the other thing that social reproduction exposes, um, this will be my last point too, is that instead of thinking about this as kind of exceptional, so thinking about Lebanon as an exceptional case, thinking about migrant domestic workers as kind of an exceptional, an exceptionally bad work environment, um, thinking about, you know, exceptional employers that are exceptionally bad, what social reproduction allows us to do is also to think about the ways that um, non-Arab migrant domestic workers today are just really the most kind of recent iteration of a long history of dependence on a class of workers that can be made different from primarily Lebanese citizens. So primarily those that have access to the quote unquote state. And I put state in quotations because for all intents and purposes, the state in Lebanon is non-existent, and it and it always has been. It's this is not recent. It's not a new collapse. This is kind of the consistent baseline. Um, and putting migrant workers in that history really helps to challenge and to to kind of challenge the proposed solutions to the exploitation migrant workers are facing, and to make really political the claims that it it is going to take far more than a legal reform to the Catalan system and the migration sponsorship system to actually protect these workers and to get them um, to a place where we can even begin to think about what the ILO has tried to get us to think about, the International Labor Organization, which is dignified labor. Um, and so effectively thinking about social reproduction takes migrant domestic workers out of this siloed approach and out of this 
kind of magnifying lens, if you will, to move away from these sensationalized stories of, of global slavery, of exploitation that women domestic workers face, which is, you know, always kind of already at the front of these reports about migrant workers, not to take away from the severity of the situation, but to actually really make it quite clear that this is a very critical part of the social reproduction landscape in Lebanon, and that that needs a fundamental shift in the way we think in order to kind of bring forward policies that might eventually protect these workers. So um, I'm happy to go into case studies in more detail in the Q&A, but I just, I think that will be enough right now, just in terms of framing my, my work. So thanks. Last but not least, yeah. okay. Thank you, uh, thank you all. Um, I have about ten minutes, uh, and uh, I think initially I was given the task of respond to <laughs> the great, great panelists, but I actually would like to take the uh, actual easier task to share my work. But maybe uh, in the last five minutes, I'll just uh, share some of my thoughts to uh, in response to uh, these talks and uh, as a way to open up our discussion. So I guess I can start with to introduce my work by uh, sharing with you two uh, scenarios um, uh, in big contrast. So the first scenario is uh, something I read uh, recently from my primary source that happened in the 1950s at the heyday of the Maoist uh, Chinese Communist uh, regime, where they were very serious about actually uh, collapsing the a boundary between production and the social reproduction. They actually had party theorists depending a uh, op-ed in one of the flagship uh, party uh, journals, uh, literally talking about how uh, by collectivizing domestic work and the child care could we actually uh, materialize real communism. So this is a literal a piece of text that I read, and they also went to train uh, public care workers, they found uh, employer-based, employers-sponsored um, uh, uh, care uh, facilities on site, uh, which you didn't have to wait uh, in the long queue and pay uh, one quarter of your income. And uh, uh, in the one of the pam pamphlets, they uh, 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 distributed to the care work, public care workers, they said that uh, care work is actually uh, not only a type of manual work, but it's also mental and emotional. So uh, it's actually a highly skilled uh, form of labor that you have to take seriously if you you are not uh, really devoted to this, if you don't care about children, if you are not a skillful uh, worker, don't bother <laughs> to come to uh, join us. That's one scenario. The second one is where I did my Foxconn um, ethnography. So I worked as a assembly line worker in uh, actually the world, as of today, the world largest iPhone manufacturing center. But I guess it's going to be uh, very quickly outsourced, uh, uh, removed to India. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway, and there, uh, not only that workers had to live in the dormitory, uh, but uh, being as, you know, moms with uh, small children, they couldn't, um, of course, they're separate from their children, and uh, they uh, uh, had to kind of go back and forth between this very intensive uh, uh, factory work uh, where they have to take the night shift for 12 hours, between that and also going back to their remote home to uh, care about their children's education. And to them, they told me that they were taking, they're actually uh, treating care as kind of a loan. Basically, they're taking a care loan by being absent, right, from their own home while uh, making more money in this uh, sweatshop uh, for the sake of investing more in their children's future. So here, I would argue like care has become a form of capital. So these are two very, very drastically different pictures we can see. So my project is basically to answer this puzzle, like why a communist social revolution, well, we all know what happened, but, but in this particular dimension of social reproduction, right? Why a program, top-down program that took seriously about social reproduction, having their own theories and the programs doing it uh, failed uh, so, uh, spectacularly to the extent that only about 40 or 50 
40 days, 40 years later, we have seen one of the world's least um, generous uh, welfare uh, regime and uh, well, worse, the world's uh, most brutal uh, way of separating social reproduction and production. And uh, the answer will be in my book. Um, but <laughs> the takeaway here, right? I don't have the time to um, elaborate more, but the takeaway here is um, here we also want to reflect on the common conventional dichotomy between social socialism and the capitalism. When you actually look into the field of social reproduction, the, suddenly this binary also collapsed in the way that um, any, I would argue, any modern uh, re industrial modernity itself, right, is a way to uh, gradually take away anything that happened in the household economy to the factory in the Fordist uh, uh, system and then to uh, the Uber <laughs> driver's seat where the Instacart um, delivers a uh, person's um, seat uh, to those, you know, spaces uh, that's getting more and more uh, fractured fragmented, but it's still right out of the home. Well, COVID, you can argue, is something well, we can talk about it in the discussion, I said, actually. So the, the takeaway is uh, um, industrial modernity and the post-industrial modernity anyway, uh, uh, if you look at it from a social reproduction perspective, are not that different between socialism and capitalism. Any um, uh, form of, you know, we have so many different uh, kind of work regimes, but none of them really takes care uh, you know, take uh, the logic of social reproduction series, which is a, such a feminine, feminine uh, you know, space, right? That's why it's got uh, invisible and marginalized in the first place, right? If you don't have to take that serious, you are doomed, right, to, to fail or to, to derail. That's, uh, the, I think, the most illustrating example, again, would be in my book, The uh, Great Leap Forward in China. Um, and then I think for the rest of the time, I would actually like to um, share some of my general thoughts on this social reproduction theory topic because we've been doing this for a whole year and we have our great guests here. So I cannot waste this opportunity, <laughs> right, to, to just uh, say something more radical or ambitious um, and to open the discussion. So I, I, I thought some of you may came here today if you are a social reproduction uh, curious, <laughs> like, oh, I want to know okay, the Chinese thing today. So many scholars are talking about that all of a sudden. I want to know what's the most, you know, uh, in, right, uh, version of it. So, but I think it's like any type of feminist inquiry, feminist uh, knowledge production, it does not need to, it does not have to have a center or a most in version of it. I, the more I reflect on it, the more I realize, right, uh, we have, you know, the uh, T.T. Bhattacharya's uh, volume five years ago, and we have uh, Dr. Madhari's uh, wonderful, that she's so perfect that she has, not just what she shared today, but if you go look at her profile online, like all different reflections, such as, you know, the uh, debate about the value generation uh, debate, which I uh, really enjoy. Anyway, um, so it's like like the 100 <laughs> flowers of uh, bloom uh, kind of thing. Uh, but that's precisely, I think, the uh, the lesson I learned from here. That is, um, this is the, the, these kind of the tensions between different uh, uh, approaches uh, in this very loosely defined social reproduction right, our realm uh, are very, you know, they're very productive tensions. And I will just give you maybe two examples, right? Uh, one is uh, the debate, right? The, the the kind of still a debate, I guess, you know, whether we should take uh, from the uh, intersectionality approach, right? Or the unitary theory, uh, whether you know, we should see gender and the class as two autonomous, a field of oppression and domination, or it's actually just one thing, right? Uh, they're constitutes of each other, right? I guess we couldn't have a solution here, given we have different approaches in our research, but that itself is a product tension. Uh, and the second thing is uh, whether we should um, uh, 
you know, uh, the debate is between this early social reproduction analysis um, from uh, starting from the uh, Italian uh, socialist feminist movement uh, and this today the new branded right uh, social reproduction theory uh, 2.0 or something. Uh, there are different you know uh, takes uh, between them, and I I was trying to have a solution, but after hearing and uh, right reading what. Uh, Dr. Madatri's uh, work, I think uh, we don't need to have a immediate solution, but talking about these uh, is really productive. And uh, and one more thing I, I learned from this uh, today's you know theme, like uh, the majority world, uh, as Gabriela's uh, work has also demonstrated, is um, something like really at the bottom of the heart is <clears throat> we're not offering you you just one more or two empirical cases, right, uh, from the rest of the world, uh, it's nice, right, to bring the periphery uh, to the spotlight, uh, to be more inclusive and uh, integrated. But I think the point is uh, to redefine the conversation itself, right? Without, uh, it's not just, oh, it's nice to, uh, to include this and that. Uh, we are the majority of the world, and the, there are different, you know, historical trajectories uh, within the so-called majority as well. So it's uh, still not just the majority over versus the minority or the West versus the rest. Uh, it's just, a, um, yeah, I, you got my point, right? Uh, so uh, so I think that also, that's where, um, so not only the US-centric or Western European-centric perspective is uh, ignoring the rest of the, you know, the complexity and the, the richness of the rest of the world, it's also very ahistorical, having this presentist uh, vibe, uh, like the, the current, some of the dominant way of uh, research in this area uh, forgot the own very complex uh, history uh, within the uh, West uh, itself. But I think by bringing uh, our, you know, sharing our work here uh, is to try to remind us, right, uh, the powerful, a historical analysis as a powerful methodology because by reading uh, Gabriela's uh, dissertation, I learned like uh, uh, all the you know uh, the way that how care workers are uh, being racialized and uh, feminized uh, were nothing but a very recent modern invention, right? Uh, back to at the turn of the 20th, 20th century, there were no difference between the theory and the Lebanese, uh, Lebanese um, uh, domestic workers. It's an uh, arbitrary, right, a uh, construction uh, due to, you know, imperial and the post-colonial power. And my own work, starting from actually also the turn of the 20th century, before China embarked on this industrial citizen, citizenship before China was even a uh, industrial country, uh, has also shown this the power of uh, long history, you know, historical analysis over the long term, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think there are so many lessons we can learn. I just open it up a little bit uh, to invite you to maybe ask more questions and share your take on all these. Um, and the last but not least, I think uh, all our the thing active uh, research we are doing here is also a reminder of um, feminist uh, political economy, uh, the, the value of that, uh, because um, um, like uh, it's not just uh, again uh, to it's nice right to to find where women are and uh, mm -hmm. they, they're being marginalized, right? It's actually without this uh, critical lens of social reproduction, uh, we would not actually explain uh, why uh, the capitalist world uh, we're living today works um, uh, in the first place. Um, that's our, just the general thought I have uh, that I want to share with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.